Okay, so uh, last uh, lesson we ended on Colossians, um, and I, I just want to kind of give a little bit of an excuse here. I know some of the videos are like 40 minutes long, and some of them are like last video I think was only like 20 minutes long. And the reason for that is because this is the first run um, of the class, and so I'm still working on the uh, on the sequencing there. So uh, that takes us to to Ephesians. Now, with some of the apostles, um, with some of the epistles, um, especially the the Paul the Pauline epistles epistles written by Paul, um, there's you know oh well he didn't really write it and he didn't really write it you know but all things considered I'm not really going to get into the arguments too much but. All things considered, um, the majority of them are most likely written by Paul. Um, as I as I may have mentioned before, I, I'm not real sure. Um, there were things called I, want, I can't really don't really know how to pronounce it, but it's basically called an, an, an amanuensis. And this person would, um, however you pronounce that word, <laughs> uh, this person would go and um, either write whatever the person was saying or maybe polish it over or that kind of an idea so it is possible that the um that the different um the different epistles could just f seem like they're written by someone else because there was someone else involved in the writing process besides paul himself okay so there are other options than just immediately saying this person did not write it now ephesians is tricky because chances are it probably wasn't even written to Ephesus. It was probably written maybe to like Laodicea or the surrounding churches. Um, I don't really have time to get into that, but um, there's just as much reason to not believe in Ephesus as the original locations there is to believe in Ephesus. Um, so it seems like the author is Paul, although maybe he gave the amanuensis a little bit more of a um, more leeway. Um, the audience uh, is e Ephesus traditionally, but um, could be the, a, a cyclical um, uh, letter that went to many people, or could have been t to Laodicea. Um, Colossians mentions a letter that went to, uh, I believe it was Laodicea. If that's the case, then this is probably that letter. Maybe, prob maybe probably. <laughs> um, it was written sometime around 61. Um, so, well, I'll get back to that. Uh, the context, Ephesus was full of cultic places and pagan worship. Um, the area, not just Ephesus, the whole area was too, but Ephesus was um, strongly too. Paul wrote to affirm proper living and understanding of spiritual warfare. Um, so, special characteristics, Ephesus was a very Roman polis. Okay, It had its courts, its gymnasium, its stadium, library, bathhouses. Um, polis is a Greek word which means um, city, you know, metropolis. Metropolis. Um, so, anyways, but it, it was a very Roman, very Roman polis, um, and it had you know the, all those traditional um, things that made a, a Roman city kind of you know um, the shiz. Uh, so the main theme of Ephesus: stand in Christ against evil as a witness. I mean, pretty simple, but I think it gets the point across. Um, so with Ephesians, there's a few things that needs to be noted. Um, obviously, many people, you know, have tried to make salvation about works based on, you know, um, a to-do to list and a to-don't to list. Um, but Ephesians really um, kind of brings a, uh, an end to that when it says in 2, 8 through 10, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. Then in verse 10, just in case you had the misunderstanding that means we shouldn't have works as a sign of our faith for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do so yes good works have nothing to do with we don't earn salvation but when we have true faith in God salvation or works follow okay um, 214 for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility um, once again, Ephesians shows the idea of, of um, there is no one more or less important. There is no more or less important people. You know, it's like Jew and Greek, 
before God, he wants all people to be saved. You know, and once again, I don't want to get this too off balance, but man and woman can both be saved now, too. Now, obviously, some people have taken that too far, like the Gnostics, for instance, where there was really little or, or poor distinction between a man and a woman. Um, in fact, in some of the, some of the Gnostic Gospels, um, it references women becoming men. Obviously, a little weird, but the, the idea of, of, you know, equality taken too far. Um, men and women are both individuals, but they are still both um, equal in God's sight. So, with that being said, um, chapter 3, verse 10 says, um, His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So, excuse me, we see the church as being the, the, a testimony to the world. See, nowadays it's hard to remember this because we've got a different denomination for everything. And then we've got cults, and then we've got different religions. So, it seems like there's just a flood of options with your faith, okay? But that's not really how it was supposed to be. There was supposed to be the church, and... The church did the work, but now we've got, you know, the Baptists, and they don't associate with these people, and then the Pentecostals, and they don't associate with these people. You know, the Church of Christ over here, Catholic over here. Before, it was, excuse me, <clears throat> people with differences that made up the church. You know, we, we used to didn't ostracize so much. But then the cults got going, like, you know, Arius and Marcedon and all them. Um, and... You know, then they Christianity tweaked. Now we nowadays we have like Jehovah's Witness and the Mormons and that kind of stuff. And then there's different religions in total, like Buddhism and Hinduism and that and that kind of stuff. So you have all these different, you know, differences, <laughs> different differences, all these different um, faiths. But some of them can be rectified. Cults, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, they can't be united with Christianity. But Protestant churches can be united, regardless of whether they can or cannot be re united with Catholics. Regardless. So, I'm um, getting a little bit off topic, but chapter 4, verse 3, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Pursuing peace encourages the works of the Spirit. Um I think that's pretty important because he's talking about all these different things. And he's talking about, like, basically a united church. Stand together in Christ against evil as a witness. So, um, but then also in 4, 4 through 6, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope and you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of, of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You, you see how in, in F, F, Ephesians, Paul is going to great lengths to show the unity of, and the oneness of the body. Now, obviously, here he's mentioning the Trinity, but um, but I'm not really going to get too off topic on that. So that takes us to Philippians. Now, if you remember from our discussion of Colossians, let's go back. Philemon, all these are written about the same time in the early 60s when Paul, wherever this is, right here. When Paul is finishing up the one trip and headed towards Jerusalem, um, where he's going to be arrested. And then after two years there, he's going to go to Rome and spend two years there, which is where the book of Acts ends. And then after the book of Acts, we'll get to, we'll, we'll show, I'll show you another map of what happens then. So, you know, all this is happening. He's in Rome, and um, that's where we get um, um, Philemon, Colossians, and Ephesians. Okay, now Philippians more than likely was a little bit later in the same imprisonment. Okay, um, so Paul, the author is Paul. The audience is a church in Philippi, um, which was from his second missionary journey. Um, the letter dates to about 62. Uh, the context Paul later in his Roman imprisonment thanks the Philippian congregation and warns of various false teachers. Um, Remember that there was safety from, from persecution, there was safety from Romans um, in Judaism, okay? Romans allowed Jews to keep their faith, um, although Christians, it seems by the 60s, were not granted the same privilege, um, regardless of the fact that at first they, they, they thought of themselves as Jews and whatnot, um, the Jews thought of them as heretics, you know, and then it kind of progresses, and there starts to be this just separation between the two, to where even people who aren't Jewish or Christian are starting to realize the difference. Um, 
and that they are not not necessarily the specifics of the dis difference, but they start to realize that they are two different uh, groups of people. Um, so uh, there are, you know, obviously there, there's there's always a thread of, of what Paul calls Judaizers, people who say that you have to be Jewish in order to be saved. But then there's also almost throughout the entire New Testament the danger from the Greek society as well, because first off. In Rome, you had to do all these things to be considered not, or to be considered part of the empire, like uh, worship of the emperor, which is a key theme uh, later in the Book of Revelations and uh, First or Second Peter, maybe both. Um, and so you're gonna see that kind of, you know, and and so with these people, especially in like First Timothy, you see it a lot. Um, the the context of the city was it was seeping into the church because the people were not Jewish they were they were pagans and so that's obviously going to play a major role um, so um, let's see so Paul is later in his Roman imprisonment and, and the Philippians evidently had done something um, to um, to to give and to give him something probably fi a financial support of some kind um, and it seems like this was later on where Paul is is maybe less optimistic about him being released. Um, so it seems like this is after Acts was written, maybe. Um, unless Luke was just optimistic while Paul wasn't. Um, so uh, Philippi was a Roman colony. Um, a lot of veterans. Um, actually, a lot of veterans. It doesn't seem like the Philippian church was necessarily rich um, or very Roman, per se, um, just because of some of the things that he says. But um, it seems like they were more poor, but um, the city was 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 had, did have a lot of the veterans. Um, it was medium-sized in, in Macedonia. Um, I, I already mentioned them. it was mostly poor. It was positioned on a major highway, um, which obviously is going to play a big role in the ancient world because that usually meant more progressive things going on um, they were they caught the gossip they caught what's going on through the through the empire um, as far as some people who would say that Philippians may potentially be multiple letters put together all things considered it's probably not a combined letter um, so the main theme then is is rejoice always um, pretty simple theme um, but I mean you know so Philippians 2 6 through 8 says um, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So, um, in some of your different translations, are going to read a little bit differently. Form basically means very nature. Uh, something to be grasped means more something to cling to. Okay, not that, not that um, Jesus, you know, oh, well, he just didn't understand it. No, no, that's not what it's saying at all. It's saying he didn't, he didn't cling to that. Um, he was willing to lay it aside. Made himself nothing, basically saying that he served others. Um, and so when it says that God the Father exalted him, he was God before, but he hadn't died for the sins of the world before. So he was exalted. He was given uh, his reputation, I guess you could say, was increased, if you will. Uh, he was... He, he was revealed in a newer way than he was in the Old Testament. So, um, in 3.2, we see, um, Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. This was actually a Jewish term for the Gentiles that Paul applies um, to these other groups of people um, who are trying to make the Christians Jew Jewish. <laughs> kind of funny, um, all things considered. 4.4-8, four, four through eight, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, and it goes on and it ends with, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then in verse 9 says, uh, actually I'm going to skip verse 9, but if you look, he's showing a clear clear line of thought here. And in verse 7, he even, sends, he even says, um, your hearts and your minds, and he leads with the next verse into how, what you should be thinking about. So um, obviously his, his line of thinking is this, rejoice first off, then um, after you've rejoiced, you, your mind will probably be clearer. So then... Um, 
um, uh, present your request with thanksgiving, and then control your thoughts. See, oftentimes we just try to control our thoughts, and we, oh, I can't control my thoughts. Rejoice in the Lord, then present whatever's got your mind so preoccupied to the Lord with thanksgiving, and then think on the good things, okay? So, um, in 4, 11 through 13, one of the really abused scriptures, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know that it is to have what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things. That, I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. Um, basically, what he's saying is he trusts in God. It's not saying that that he can do all things. It's saying he can he can weather the storms of life. He he can he can go through these things in following the Lord because um, um, because as he says here uh, it is the Lord who gives him strength. That's what he's saying. It's not saying you know people have taken this verse drastically out of context and oh I can I can do all things. Well eh, let's put a let's put a let's put a pin in that. So, so this takes us to to um, Paul's last missionary journey. Now if you look. Excuse me, let me grab my pointer here. He's in Rome here, okay? Now he goes down, down, down to Crete, then up to Nicopolis, okay? And then up around here to Spain, and then you go over here, and you see, oops, went to the wrong one, wrong one and he goes to Jericho, up and around, Tyre to Britannia, and then up and back around to Rome, where he is presumed, presumably um, arrested again. Um, this is obviously not recorded in Acts. This is after the book of Acts, so it's it, it's obviously it's a little bit tentative, I guess you could say. And we don't know if there was more or less places that he visited. Um, Nicopolis was probably somewhere on there, as he mentions going there. Um, so um, that takes us to what is called the pastoral epistles, um, Titus and First and Second Timothy. Okay, so the author is probably Paul once again, um, although he probably used a different amanuensis based on the writing style. Um, also, keep in mind that his writing could have changed because he had a different purpose, a different audience, a different age, different content. The, the, the times were changing, and so different stuff needed to be addressed, so different style, you know, um, a lot of different things coming into, and coming into play there. The audience was Titus and probably the church at Crete as well. He probably wanted Titus to, to read it and then have it read to, or, or um, uh, read out loud to the church. Um, and the date is probably sometime around 63. Um, once again, Titus and First Thing Timothy kind of depend on when Paul was rearrested. So they kind of figure that that this was, um, if you look at this map, that 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 Paul ended this this trip to Rome in about 67 on, based on this map. So um, Titus and and First and Second First Timothy is going to be after Paul is released. Okay, and then Second Timothy is going to be when he's re-arrested in Rome after this trip here. Okay, I hope that that kind of makes sense. Um, context: Having been freed from his Roman imprisonment, Paul writes Titus to put the church in order. Um, so, uh, some special characteristics: Crete um, was not as troubled as Ephesus. Um, if you notice, First uh, Timothy talks about a lot of the same content that Titus does, but First Timothy kind of goes on about it a little bit more. Uh, judging by the introduction, Titus was probably written first, maybe, that's what people usually figure, but uh, First Timothy definitely had did have more things that needed to be addressed, such as um, the issue with the women and, and whatnot. Um, so, uh, let's see. As I mentioned, these kinds of things were always meant to be read to, to the whole church. Um, and, and the start of the church in Crete is never mentioned. Um, when Paul is in Crete, and I think it's Acts, um, it just kind of breezes over it. The main theme of Titus then seems to be devote yourself to good. Um, kind of, kind of that's what the theme seems to be to me. Um, and setting things, you know, in order, sometimes we can get a little bit bogged down with things. But it seems like in, in Titus, Paul is more saying devote yourself to doing the good, even as you're setting things in order. Um, so, and that takes us to... Uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Um, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. Now, he's not saying nothing mixes impure. That's what people commonly, you know, who, who want to get away with doing whatever they want, they take this verse drastically out of context. 
you know, hey, nothing makes us impure. That's not what he's saying at all. Um, he's talking about food, marriage, drink, n not immorality, not drugs, not selfishness. That's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about the food and the marriage and those things, okay? Um, so he's not saying nothing makes us impure, okay? Just making sure that we understand that. Verses 16 through 2 through 1. Um, to one, I should say, they claim to know God, but by their actions they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Now, notice how doctrine and actions are inseparable in, in Titus and 1 Timothy both. And oftentimes he'll talk about their bad teachings, and he'll talk about the evidence. And I'll contrast those two things, the evidence of the bad teaching or good teaching versus the, what the actual teaching itself is. See, and, and, and nowadays we would like him to you know, list all these things. List all these things that they're doing wrong. So that way we know not to do it forever. But that, that's not what he does. He talks about the evidence of it a lot a lot of times more than the actual content of it. And so it's sometimes a little bit difficult to figure out what the actual problem is. And that's one of the one of the reasons why we get a little bit confused as to whether Paul is talking about Gnosticism or just Greek culture. Because um, there's some things that, that, that they're just not real specified. In chapter 2, verse 2 through 5, he says, Teach older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, and love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanders or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and, and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will mind the word of God. Um, the only... The only place in Titus that, that kind of touches on what um, First Timothy does with, with the women being submitted, by the way, is, is probably that part right there where it said, um, subject to their own husbands. And another one of the reasons why in First Timothy I'm going to suppose that it's not talking about leadership, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so uh, everyone has a purpose. If you notice, you went through everybody in the church. Some people think, oh, I'm old, so I don't have anything to do. Oh, I'm too young. No, no, no. Not in Titus. In Titus, he, he makes it point, perfectly clear that everyone has a purpose. So 2.10b through uh, 14, or and actually not through 14, but and 14, says this. Um, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. And then in 14 he says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Um, and so good living equals a good witness and worship to God. You know, he, throughout the whole, throughout the book here, he, he stresses that. That the good living is a good witness to people, but it is also worship to God. So, uh, why do we live separate from the world? To be a testimony, but also because that is a form of worship. Okay, so 2.13 says, um, while we wait for the blessed hope, the, uh, the appearing of the glory of our uh, great, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Once again, that Jesus um, um, is God in our salvation there. Um, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice that. God and Savior Jesus Christ. And also, did he just say appearing, a physical thing that's going to happen, not as a Jehovah's Witness claim with the whole God has already sp spiritually came. Um, not that this is the only place that teaches that, but, you know, obviously a place that teaches that. Um, so Jesus is God and our salvation. Now, we're going to end with 1 Timothy for this lesson. Um and it's written about the same time as Titus, more than likely, based on the different factors, in about 63. Now remember, Peter is probably going to be killed somewhere around like 64, 65 somewhere, and Paul is probably going to be killed somewhere around 67, I would say. I'm not real sure, but you know, these are all mostly speculation at this point, unless other evidence has surfaced, which it probably won't. And the author is Paul, the audience is Timothy, and the church at Ephesus. Um... Once again, with it being written to a person, but then read to the whole church. Um, date is sometime around 63, as I mentioned before, about the same time as, as, as Titus. The context, around the same time Paul writes Titus, he also writes Timothy in regards to heretical problems. Now in Ephesus, you can definitely see the, the, the uh, emphasis is more on the combating the heretical doctrine. And in Titus, it's more on just getting the church in order. So you can definitely see the different emphasis. So this is some, some special characteristics. Um, Paul spent much time in Ephesus. Um, if you remember, I think it was his third missionary trip. He spent like two years there, two or three years there. So um, he had, he had definitely had a lot of experience in Ephesus, um, and you you definitely see him um, doing a lot of stuff there, writing there. 
um, in the area kind of a lot. And then Timothy um, is set up there. And then eventually, John, one of the twelve, John, is going to flee to Ephesus, or go to move to Ephesus, I guess you could say, with uh, Jesus' mother. And he's going to become, it appears as though he is the one that it mentions about him being the elder. Um, this is kind of interesting that he just became the elder of the church and allowed Timothy to still, you know, kind of interesting there. Um so uh, it's it's the nearest large city to uh, Colossae, Colossians. Um, there was very apparent Greek and Jewish threats. Honestly, it just it just seems like a cluster cluster of different things. Um, and because of the generalities of the beliefs, we can really kind of have a hard time uh, distinguishing which things he's specifically combating. Um, um, Although, of course, by this time, conflict is kind of widespread. So, um, seems like the church is kind of, and then outside of the church, you know, they're having problems with the society as well. So, there's going to be a lot of things that Paul mentions in, in um, keeping good attitudes towards the community, but also in setting up things in the church where it's not going to condone heresy, okay? Um, so, the main theme seems to be leading a church from heresy. That seems to be the main theme here. Um, and, and just the, the, the tone that, that Paul takes in Timothy is, I think, is very important. So let's look at a few verses here. Um, in 2, 12 through 14, it says, I think Christ, I'm sorry, I'm in 1, 2, 12 through 14, I do not permit a woman, um, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet, for Adam was formed first, um, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing. I'll stop there. Um, now, there's been a few things. Throughout history, this has been viewed in a lot of different ways. Um, some people today take it to mean that Paul is saying women cannot be in leadership um, in, in ministry. Um, and they base that on the fact that it says um, women to teach or to assume authority. Both of these things are attributed to the pastor later on in the letter. However, it is important to note that they're not mentioned as being uh, parts of the pastor consecutively and only applying to the pastor um, necessarily, just that it is things that, two different things in two different places that are attributed to the works of a pastor. So um, a little thin there. Um, also, there's the issue that that's not really strictly said anywhere else in Scripture. And so we're kind of hard-pressed to form an entire doctrine that women should not be in leadership and ministry based off of one passage. If we had more definite stuff, maybe, I mean, think of Aquila and Priscilla. The wife is mentioned first in reprimanding, or, or not reprimanding, but in training and teaching, if you will, um, uh, Apollos. Now, now, once again, some people would say, yes, but the husband was there. Yes, but she was still ha was exercising a place of authority over a man. So at least in some degree that. Then consider in the book of Judges, where Deborah, for instance, is play plays a major role. So to say that that view seems a little bit... Mm. There's another point, too. In Greek, it switches from uh, um, women to a woman. Why would Paul do that unless he was trying to emphasize a wife, maybe? Uh, obviously, there are other reasons. Um, just variation of, of vocabulary could work just as well. But it seems kind of in the context that he's not talking about leadership yet. In fact, it's the next section that he starts talking about leadership. Here he's talking about um, inter, um, intergender relations and how they, how they relate to each other. So at the... Um, it, it seems like he's talking about men and women generally, maybe, or uh, husbands and wives. Okay, um, it seems most prob probable, though, given the context and c in comparing this to other scriptures, he's specifically talking to men about men and women. I mean, man and wife, especially husband and wife, especially in, in, in light of the fact that in Peter um, he talks about um, wives having a similar attitude like this to save their husband, and in Titus, as we just looked at, he mentioned about being subject to your husband, and so it seems kind of likely that he's just expounding the theme to kind of help combat the heresy, um, in which case the main theme is that um, wives are not the head, the husband is the head of the home. That would be his, his main point. Um, now, I'll, bra I'll, dial I'll break this apart. Actually, let's go there now. If you look at it, he's talking about women being modest and humble in verses 9 through 10, 
and then um, or you could even say um, their their actions okay and then verse 15 ends again with their actions okay so verse 11 talks about women should learn why is this because Eve was deceived as he mentions in 14 then he mentions in verse 12 I do not print a woman to teach or have authority why is this because Adam was formed first what does this show is that shows us that the reason why he's not allowing women to women to teach or have authority is because Adam was formed first now the example of Adam and Eve obviously is of husband and wife now this kind of once again kind of pushes towards the idea of him talking about husbands and wife. There are a lot of other um, reasons, things he could have said if he wanted it to be clarified that it was about women and men more broadly. It's it's very important not to rush to any conclusion in this, but it is important that if this passage really is a chiasm like I'm showing on here, then the main point is in verse then of verse 12 um, that she must be quiet. This word obviously does not mean absolute silence. It means um, more of her demeanor that she should be respectful. Okay, if that is his main point, in all the things that she does. It, her main attitude or her main demeanor, the way she presents herself, should be respectful. Okay, or, um, that kind of idea. Um, if that is true, that kind of clarifies this. You know, once again, um, you don't see Paul making too much reference on things that are culture specific. I mean, sometimes he does like the hats thing, but it seems most likely, especially in this context, that he is. Um, that he's just talking about wives and, and having that, that demeanor, especially in comparing it to Titus that doesn't have anything about women not being leadership. And then it goes to the next passage where it is talking about leadership, and he doesn't mention anything about women not being leadership. So we're a little bit hard-pressed to say, yes, he is definitely talking about women not being leadership. There's a possibility that he is, but it's important that nowadays we do not establish a doctrine based off of one verse. Okay, Analyze all of Scripture, not just the ones that benefit you. I personally know that know of a lot of women who have been unsuited for ministry, especially leadership. And I have also known many men who are unsuited for leadership. And I have also known some women who did a fantastic job of pastoring church. And some, um, however, they did say that it was very difficult to go home and then take off that hat of authority to be submitted to their husband. Kind of a little bit difficult there. Um, so, anyways, but, um, and then verse 15, he talks about childbearing. It seems like what his main point is just that childbearing is good. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but uh, hopefully that will help you with that. Um, so in verse 15 he says, But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay, now um, it does switch from the singular to plural, but she will be saved if they continue. So um, it seems all things considered, and I'm not going to get too much into this, but it seems he's addressing three possible situations. First off, um, let me switch this finger. Um, celibacy is, is kind of um, one of the things that the heretics are spreading, that you should you should abstain from marriage. Okay, but then also in Ephesus, Artemis worship was a big deal, and it was very common for the women to pray to Artemis for safe child for safe child um, um, childbirthing. Okay, um, but then also there's the idea of Gnosticism or Greek thought, um, which kind of blurred the lines between man and woman. Um, and kind of um, emphasized women became, need need to be more like men rather than like Christ per se. Um, obviously, I could get more into that, but it seems like all things considered, his point here is just simply it is a good thing for women to have babies, for them to do that. But um, they need to continue in faith, love, and holiness, which is the essence of of Christianity: faith in God, which leads us to love, which leads us to holy living. See what I mean? So that kind of seems like that that's his emphasis there. Just don't push us too far. Seems like he's just simply saying that that, that, that when women, if a woman does not stay submitted to her husband, she's going to be kept from, from maybe um, temptation that she wouldn't be otherwise. But it seems more than that, that he's just simply saying, um, women, you have a very important job to do, and don't let these people tell you that it's not important, because that's what they were saying. You know, don't get married. Um, you need to pray to the pagans, to the pagan gods, to be saved from this. Or once again, the Gnostic thought that women need to be more like men. So whichever one of those options, um, or a combination of them. Um, and three, two. I know a lot of people take this out of out of context. Now, the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife. What that means there, faithful to his wife, is a one man woman. I'm sorry, a one-woman man. And given the fact that men didn't have multiple wives back then, they couldn't afford it. Um, it was very rare, very rare. So it, not not popular enough for, for Paul to mention in his letters. Um, as far as having previous wives, um, that doesn't seem to be what he's saying at all in the fact that he says a one...
woman, man. Kind of doesn't really make sense there. Um, especially as in 1 Corinthians, he already gives the justification that you can um, get remarried. So, it seems all things considered, what he's simply saying is to a man who is faithful to his wife. You don't want an adulterer in leadership, is what he's saying. Um, a man needs to be invested in his wife to, to be a leader, um, as we've seen on the news multiple times. In 4.16, he says, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Right understanding and right living. Both are shown to be important. Right understanding, this is doctrine, theology, if you will. And right living, this is the more application side of it, okay? Both of these things are important, because people will do what they believe. And they will... Um, you know, if they believe something, it'll lead them to an action somewhere. So it seems like he's giving a balance here. Obviously, doctrine is not the most important thing, but it is not unimportant. As some people are taking it extremes on, another thing that we can take in balance, okay? Um, don't push this too far, but he's obviously showing the distinction between them. And in giving good doctrine to your hearers, you keep them, you pr you, you prevent them from, um, from falling prey to... Um, uh, falling prey, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, falling prey to the heresies. So I hope that I didn't make that too confusing, that I kind of broke that down good enough for you. Um, once again, though, um, once again, though, uh, in, in Timothy, it's, it's very important to notice that he is specifically talking about things, um, things that have to do with church leadership and i think that is pretty important um next video will be about first peter saint timothy and saint peter um i hope that i you know clarified that for you um and i thank you again for watching this